The book of Esther is perfect proof that God isn't just behind the scenes, but he controls the scenes he's behind. And although the name of God is not mentioned once in the entire book, it's the nature of God that should cause us to take a second look. From the raising up of Esther to be queen, to the recycling of Haman's gallows, who would fall prey to his own scheme, the silent sovereignty of God shows us that nothing in life is by chance or coincidence, but rather providence. Throughout the pages of this book, we see that God may be silent, but he is never absent. And when it seems as if evil is poised to be the final judgment, no weapon formed against God's people will be triumphant. So just as Esther interceded with the truth, likewise in these last days is the role of the church. You see, God's sovereignty is best summarized in Mordecai's exhortation to Esther in the midst. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. This is Esther, Silent Sovereignty. All right, so I love how that kind of sets the stage for the book of Esther. I want to do some defining as a framework because you're going to hear the ministers who are teasing out the book of Esther use words like sovereignty and providence. Sovereignty is a big theological word. If I was going to apply other characteristics of God to his sovereignty, first and foremost, sovereignty is supreme rule. God has supreme rule. He's omnipotent, all-powerful in his sovereignty. He's omniscient, all-knowing, all-knowledge in his sovereignty. Omnipresent, always in all places, everywhere, in all times, in his sovereignty. So we have to understand, this is big God theology. If you have a handle of God's sovereignty, it does not mean that you know everything, but it means that you know that God knows and that solves everything. So sovereignty actually has another interesting word within it, and it's providence. Providence is often mistaken as chance, luck, coincidence. But providence biblically is remarkable. Now, miraculously, when you have a miracle, especially in the Bible, it is when God, ready? overrides the natural with the supernatural. That's a miracle. So Jesus turned water into wine. He overrode the natural with the supernatural. The splitting of the Red Sea, God overrode the natural with the supernatural. That's a miracle. Providence is when God uses the natural supernaturally. You have no idea how providential your life is because to you, it's natural. But to God, he's using the natural supernaturally. With Romans 8, 28, as a staple, no matter what you're going through, good, bad, or ugly. Now think about that. It all has a divine purpose providentially in God's economy because he's using the natural supernaturally. Now there's creative order in God's sovereignty. I know this is like a lecture, but you gotta get this. Creative order in God's sovereignty is the fact that he created. He brought order. There's an origin. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God. Okay, creative order. Now he has a sustaining order out of his creative order. And that is with ordinances. Because if there's an origin in the beginning, then God has a sustaining order to keep things going. But that is built on absolute truth or ordinances. Things begin to break down when we defy or rebel against ordinances. So God at times is user, using the miraculous to bring things back to order or providence, which is, you ready? His ability to make his will accomplished through human will. That's providence. God is ordering everything according to the counsel of his will. All right, interesting fact. There's only two books of the Bible, 66 in, as, a, as a whole. Two of them have names that are women's names. Ruth, that book, and Esther, two of the 66. Another interesting fact, as you heard in the video, 
the name of God is not mentioned in two books in the Bible. One, Song of Solomon, you will not find any reference to God, Jehovah, any mentioning of God's name, and Esther. In fact, there was a lot of debate on whether or not the book of Esther was inspired by God and should have been included in the canon of scripture because of the fact that God's name is not mentioned. Interestingly, and I'll touch on this probably in a study ahead, there are five acrostics that are embedded into the book of Esther. What is an acrostic? It's the first letter of a word, and if you follow the second, or the first letter of a second word, you can read an actual word. That is where you will find some of the names of God. It's interesting. Now, whether or not man has created that, it's not known, but it's still fascinating. My main point for you to get before we begin is God may be silent, but he is never absent. His name may not be mentioned, but his nature is threaded from the beginning all the way to the conclusion, 10 chapters in the book of Esther. Somebody needs to know just that point. We can actually close out in prayer with just that point because you are saying, I don't see God, I don't feel God, I can't hear God, and I'm saying that does not negate the fact that he is there, he is everywhere, and he is sovereign, and he has a providence. Charles Spurgeon said this quote, God is too good to be unkind, he is too wise to be mistaken, and when we cannot trace his hand, we must trust his heart. I love that. Because there are times where I can't trace God's hand. What are you up to? Why did that happen the way it happened? I don't see any evidence of God. But all the while, if I trust his heart and I know sovereignty and I know providence, I can rest assured with a hope that anchors my soul and transcends my circumstances. We don't know who wrote the book of Esther. There's a lot of speculation. Some say Mordecai. He will be one of the actors, and I will call him an actor because it plays like a play. It unfolds like a playwright. In chapter two, we'll learn more about Mordecai. Whether he was the writer or not, whoever wrote the book of Esther has a very good handle on Persian and Jewish culture. They write masterfully. Again, whoever this author is, they write in such a way where the non-believer who doesn't want to read about the name of God can still see how something was happening behind the scenes. And it's not coincidence. They write of God's silent sovereignty, which is the name of this book series, how he may be invisible, but his plan is always invincible. There's not a single miracle mentioned in the book, as I've said earlier, but the entire book itself is a miracle. Why is it so miraculous? Look at me. Because it's meticulous. This book is so meticulous. We're going to take our time making our way through. We're going to cover the entire first chapter this morning, but there's a lot of details that are not written into the book. History helps us fill the gap. Here are the actors. If I was to call them to the stage. Now, please understand, when we go through biblical accounts, these individuals are real people. Like you and I. They lived. They died. They navigated their times. So it's easy to kind of make it like a myth or like a fable. It reads as a story. But I'm saying to you, as Mordecai said to Esther, hey, what if you existed for such a time as this? It was a rhetorical question. Who knows? God knows. So instead of looking at our times and saying, gosh, how am I going to raise children when the world and the culture are fallen? It's never been worse. And I'm saying, who knows? Perhaps God has allowed you to live with your family for such a time as this. So what's the implications? Here are the actors. Esther will learn who she is, a Jewish orphan girl. Mordecai, her cousin, raises Esther. We'll learn about them in chapter two. Xerxes, his name is mentioned more than any other actor in this book. Xerxes is a name in human history. Now I'm getting ahead of myself here, but just to give you some imagery, the movie 300 
And the king of Persia, that's Xerxes, that type of maniac with the piercings all in his face. He acted as if he was a god king. He called himself the king of kings because he truly was a king that conquered other kings. Therefore, he said, I'm the king of kings. Now, we understand there's only one king of kings. More about Xerxes as you read about it in your Bible. His name is Ahasuerus. But that's not a name as much as it's a title. Like Darius, that's a title, not really a name. Ahasuerus means Lion King. His real name is Xerxes, so they're interchangeable. If I use Ahasuerus or I use Xerxes, I'm speaking of the same character. We will be introduced to Vashti, Xerxes' queen, in chapter 1. And the antagonist, because there's always an antagonist, a picture or a foreshadow of the Antichrist, anti-Semitism runs through this book. It's interesting to note that anti-Semitic attitudes are on the rise today around the world. Haman is his name. Now, Xerxes would inherit a kingdom that conquered the known world at this time in human history. I'll tease out a little bit of those empires just so I want to, again, look at me. I want to set the historical stage before you are introduced to some of these characters and these actors in this amazing biblical account. You got to understand where we're at in human history. Xerxes at this point in history is the king or the conqueror of the world. And yet when you think about the vastness of his empire, how powerful and prominent he was, God would raise up a little Jewish girl to conquer his heart out of nowhere. So think about that. This is the figure in the empire and God behind the scenes is raising up this little Jewish girl to eventually be able to rapture his heart, interceding on behalf of her people. This is how God works. Her role in the book of Esther, she saves the Jewish race from genocide, from Haman, So again, I say, I said it in the book of Daniel multiple times, I'm going to say in the book of Esther, God is able to use unrighteous rulers to accomplish his righteous rule, period, right? Because however you want to classify presidents or politicians or kings or Caesars or emperors or kings, God is able to use all of these players in the role of history to accomplish his will and his righteous rule. So however I want to label a leader and say, you know what, I don't agree with them, I'm simply saying, you don't have to agree, but you got to understand God is doing a work behind the scenes. For example, and I think we've become so close to this issue that we don't understand the implications of what it meant and how it should impact the church. And it took place last Friday, and it was the overturning of a decision known as Roe v. Wade, whether you know this or not, was connected to other cases, 1993, Casey versus Planned Parenthood, the Dobbs case out of Mississippi, which was a present day case that had them reopen the case in 1993, which had them go all the way back to 1973, which was an unconstitutional ruling by seven out of the nine Supreme Court justices to actually look at the constitution and write into there something that was not there in the 14th amendment, namely abortion rights. But abortion rights is not something that is real because there's nothing right about abortion. So what did they do? They overturned it. And I said it online, I'll say it in here. Sadly, across America, there were pulpits on that Sunday who didn't even mention it. And I say that type of pastor is an imposter. If you can't highlight the greatest ruling in a very long time about the sanctity of life, then you don't represent the God of the Bible who is pro-life from the womb. Jesus went through the conception process. Our God chose, I'm glad you applauded that. Our God chose to go through the conception and the pregnancy full term and be birthed out of a womb. God chose that sanctification of life for his own son. It's a simple truth that says that must be protected at all costs, preserved at all costs. 
So what we saw is a response, all types of responses. I called it a convulsion of evil. People just like the exorcist, just yelling at the top of their lungs that women's rights were taken. And I'm saying people that are yelling that did not even know how to define what a woman was about a month ago. <laughs> Again, human rights are wrong when they contradict what God says is right for humans. 60 plus million babies were aborted. That means everybody in this room is connected to someone or you are that someone who has had that experience. And this church will never shame you for that. In fact, you're looking at a minister who was also responsible for taking life in March of 2009 through a drunk driving fatality. I made an ignorant, reckless decision and that cost life. And I have to live with that. But you're also looking at a minister who understands that forgiveness was given to me by my God, fully, freely, and forever. And that same healing and that same forgiveness, he wants to offer to everyone, no matter what you've done. But we are the ones that are to rally around life. So yeah, guess how that happened? To be very candid, a president in the previous administration decided to appoint three conservative justices that would just so happen to be for such a time as this to overturn a ruling for 49 years and place it back into the states. Now, stay with me because I'm moving kind of quick at this particular point. God is not interested in reform. God is interested in repentance. Reform will accomplish nothing. It might be beneficial, but repentance is crucial. So the church is to do the work of repentance. Why is that paramount? I'm currently looking at the book of Jeremiah as well. Jeremiah will be teased out on Thursdays. Jeremiah came onto the scene at the edge of the kingdom of Judah where reform was going throughout the land. But reform wasn't enough. Jeremiah's message was, it's great that you tore down the altars. It's great that you're dealing with the God of Moloch and you're trying to preserve life, but it's about repentance because if the heart doesn't change, nothing will change. You cannot legislate morality or integrity. It is a work of the Holy Spirit. Okay, back where are we? In the book of Daniel, Jeremiah, <laughs> Esther? We are at a place where we understand God uses unrighteous rulers to accomplish his righteous rule. And he always has a remnant or a prophet in the midst of pending or active judgment. Let me say that again. He always has a remnant or a prophet in the midst of pending or active judgment. Now, when you hear the word judgment, it's a word that's not understood as it should. Judgment is always a cycle that God is administering. Always. He's always judging. But judgment accomplishes two things on any people or any land. The first thing it accomplishes is punishment. Those that don't believe in God, there's a punishment. Those that are rejecting God, they say they know him, but they're rejecting him. There's a punishment. And those that say, I don't agree with some of these decisions from my rulers and they're coming down the pike and they're affecting me and my family, but I'm not seeing it as punishment as much as I'm seeing it as refinement. Because what you notice over the past two and a half years is where people's loyalties truly lie, where they're really allegiant, whether or not they actually believe what they say they believe. And that has been a sad reality for me as a minister, seeing people who used to come here no longer go here. They've departed. As soon as COVID hit, BC, before coronavirus, they were in the seats. But as soon as that tested their faith and they began to trust man as opposed to God or government over God, they departed. Sad reality. I unapologetically present that as a reality. Why? What can man do to me? If God is for me, what can anything do against me? Isaiah's ministry will actually go back 100 plus years before the Persian Empire. Isaiah prophesied about Babylon. Now, here we go. Babylon was a tool in the hands of God to punish and refine Israel. Jeremiah comes on the scene after Isaiah. He is yelling at the top of his lungs. He's known as the weeping prophet. He is proclaiming, repent, judgment is coming. It's pending, it's active, it's coming in the form of the Babylons, the Babylonians. Babylonians come on the scene. Jeremiah sees what Isaiah was talking about. 
He continues his ministry. He hands off the baton to two prophets, Daniel, who is actually a captive in the palace when Babylon is the world power, and Ezekiel, who's a prophet on the other side of the palace. He's with the commoners. Daniel is used by God in the palace. Ezekiel is used by God in the town. Cyrus the Great overthrows the Babylonian empire. The main name was Nebuchadnezzar. Put this together, Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, Cyrus the Great, Persia, the Medes and the Persians, the next great world empire. At the beginning of his reign, he signs an edict or decree to set the Jews free, to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild their city. God uses unrighteous rulers to accomplish his righteous rule. He has a son. His name is Darius the first. Darius takes over in 521. He's a Persian. Persians are ruling the world. Darius has a son named Xerxes. Xerxes takes over in 486 BC. When Darius is ruling, Ezra is rising. When Darius dies and the kingdom goes to his son Xerxes, Ahasuerus, Esther is rising. Xerxes has a son named Artaxerxes. When he's rising, Nehemiah is being raised up. Ezra, Esther, Nehemiah. Why do these details matter? Romans 15, verse 4. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope. That's about the Old Testament. Whatever was written before, like when Paul wrote this, he was saying, hey, all of those Old Testament accounts, those scriptures, they matter. They're for our learning, number one, but also that through the scriptures, there's endurance. That's the word patience, being able to stand up under pressure and comfort. That's the word encouragement, infused by courage. Why? Because those two, endurance and courage, offer hope. Hope is one of the greatest influences or powers that the Christian should have. We look at templates, we look at threads, we look at truths that are in the Old Testament that run through the scriptures to afford us, ready, hope. Why? Because as believers in the hope of heaven, what we are living for is always greater than what we are going through. Biblical hope needs to be understood before we look at Esther and Mordecai. Why? Biblical hope is more than a wishbone. Oh, I hope this works out. I hope things get better for you. I hope you get the job. No, biblical hope is way more than a wishbone. Biblical hope stiffens the backbone. Biblical hope strengthens the jawbone. Backbone to stand up when everybody else around you is sitting down. Jawbone to speak up when everybody else around you is silent. This is what hope accomplishes. How do I know that? Because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Babylon, they had a hope. Regardless of what you do to us, we believe our God can deliver us hope. Our God will deliver us hope. And even if he doesn't deliver us hope, biblical hope is what had Daniel praying when the government said, you can't pray. Biblical hope is what had the early church and the disciples preaching Jesus when that was a punishable offense. We're going to see hope rise in Esther for such a time as this. Mordecai, who would be used to influence her. Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the ready undertitle. That's what the word, that's what the word substance means here. What do you mean? It's a guaranteed agreement. It's a contract. It's a title deed. Faith is a title deed. Faith is a contract that God gives you. When you sign a contract, you might not have access to the house just yet, but you own it based on the contract. Faith is a contract of things hoped for, the absolute expectation of coming good, and that good is as God defines it. And it's the evidence of things not seen. I can't see God yet, but do you have conviction? That's what the word evidence means. I have a conviction. I can't see God. I don't hear God, but I know he's there and he sees me. Esther chapter one. (sighs) 
first one. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, Xerxes. This was the Ahasuerus who reigned over 127 provinces from India, that would have been to the east, to Ethiopia, that would have been to the southwest. In those days when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the citadel. Okay, common day, Iran. All right, think about your map. Babylon was common day, Iraq. Persia was common day, Iran. So those two countries are still very active in the Middle East. That in the third year of his reign, he made a feast for all of his officials and servants, the powers of Persia and Media, the nobles, the princes, the provinces being before him. Who are all these people? People of prominence, princes and nobles and rulers. When he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor of his excellent majesty for many days, how many days? 180 days in all. That's six months. That's 180 days. What is going on here? He's not only showing off the vastness of his kingdom, he's invited all of the princes and the nobles to come to a 180 day, ready? Military summit. What do I mean? It's not just a party, it's not just a feast. It's not just a banquet, it's actually a time where he's convincing all of the people of his empire about going to war again against Greece. So before we go forward, let me take you backward. The year is 490 BC, seven years before this party, this summit. And what happened was the beginning of the Greco-Persian Wars. The father of Xerxes, Darius, wanted to overthrow the Grecian city-states that were causing him trouble. They were thorns in the flesh. He underestimated the ability for the Greeks to fight war in an uncanny way. What happened was the Battle of Marathon, which is world-renowned, the Greeks overcame the forces of the Persian army. This is where we get, it's a myth, that the Greek soldier ran 26 miles from Marathon, Greece, to Athens, declaring the victory. That didn't really happen. It's an actual combination of two stories. The army actually marched 25 miles from Marathon to Athens. And during the battle, a soldier ran over 100 miles for a different reason. When they started the Olympics in Greece, they needed some type of historical account to celebrate the legacy of the Grecian overcoming the Persians. So they, they looked at Marathon and they married these two stories and said, hey, let's create a race. We'll call it a marathon where people will run 26 miles. That is the origin. Hey, any of you crazies in here that run marathons? You can think about Esther when you're on that final leg. Darius comes back, wants to get vengeance on the Greeks, but he dies. That vengeance passes on to his son, Xerxes. He calls for a 180-day military summit, bringing everybody together to convince them that what happened in 490 is not going to happen again. Look at the vastness of our kingdom and the resources that we have access to. It's a psychological attempt to convince them, support me going back to war. That's what's happening here for six months. They are strategizing about going back to Greece. Now, keep in mind, with all these details unfolding, think about that, what I just said, and other battles. And God is working behind the scenes. Because without this six-month summit and the eventual battle to follow, there's no raising up of Esther. There's no calling his queen, Vashti, to depose her, which we're about to get into. See, the point here which I want you to see is providence is the hand of God in the glove of history. Providence is the hand of God in the glove of history. Your history, my history, hey, I'd be remiss if I didn't apply this truth to our country's history. Yeah, we were born 246 years ago 
on July 4th. But I see that we need to be born again in 2022. Many people have no idea that this country was framed and founded on Judeo-Christian values. You can read all of the documents that drove our governmental structure and see the language that was used and chosen by those that believed in God, many of which were Christians. And the direct Declaration of Independence itself, the first two paragraphs, by reading them, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal equal station to which the laws of nature, that's morality, natural laws, and nature's God, because you can't have morality without being tethered to the God who gives it to you, entitles them a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. The rest of the document are the causes that have impelled them to separate from tyranny. Paragraph two, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Bible verse, all men were created in the image of God, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, rights that cannot be stripped by no one, that among them are life as God defines it, liberty as God gives it, and the pursuit of happiness. That, what's the purpose of government? That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Why do we have government? To give freedom to its people, not take it away. Freedom is God's DNA. For where the spirit of the Lord is, there is, and whom the Son sets free is free. And Jesus came to set the captives free. You guys are good. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, a.k.a. we the people. We the people who are governed by the gospel. As salt, we bring revival. As light, we hold forth the torch of the Bible. And in a land that is more comfortable for the rebel, it's looking more like Babel, we the people governed by the gospel. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form, divine order, as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Then the reasons in the body of the Declaration of Independence, and then the final paragraph. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. <laughs> We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. When you know your origin, you will recognize how far we have fallen. But that should present an appetite and a desire to preserve life and liberty because that is a reflection of the gospel and to lead with truth regardless of a culture of lies and being willing to have the only antidote that can save the sin-sick soul that's lost and it's the truth of the gospel. That's why it's no surprise that their desire is to de-Christianize our society, to remove God from any public squares or spaces. And ultimately, here's the sad reality. They use our freedoms as as I just read them, to destroy our freedoms. Thomas Jefferson said, and can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are the gift of God, that they are not to be violated, but with his wrath? Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. Wow. Remember, at the end of the six-month summit, back to the text, they're planning their eventual invasion of Greece. He is getting all of his resources together. He decides to end the six-month summit. Ready? Back to your text, verse 5, with a seven-day banquet. Why? He's convinced his leaders that they're going to go to war. And now he's going to celebrate it prematurely with the people in the kingdom. It's a morale booster. Why? Because the people in the kingdom would have to send their fathers and their husbands and their sons and no better way to get them to buy into the vision than to party 
This is what's about to happen. Watch this. And when these days were completed, the king made a feast lasting seven days for all the people who were present in Shushan, the citadel, from great to small, in the court of the garden of the king's palace. Now he's about to describe, whoever's the writer, describes how lavish and extravagant this party was. There were white and blue linen curtains fastened with cords of fine linen and purple on silver rods and marble marble pillars. And the couches were of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of alabaster turf turquoise and white and black marble. And they served drinks in golden vessels, each vessel being different from the other with royal wine in abundance, according to the generosity of the king. Verse eight, in accordance with the law, the drinking was not compulsory. What does that mean? Usually you couldn't drink unless the king drank. In other words, you're sitting around, you're having fellowship. When the king would toast or drink, you could drink. Here, this party, it's unrestrained. You may drink however you like. For so the king had ordered all the officers of his household that they should do according to each man's pleasure. Are you, are you, are you catching the scene here? Are you seeing what's happening? Why is this important? The stage is being set without a six month military summit, rolling over to a seven day debauchery party. There would not be what's about to happen next. Verse nine, Queen Vashti also made a feast for the women in the royal palace, which belonged to King Ahasuerus. So while the men and the people are having a party over here, the queen's having her own feast. I don't dare conjecture or be dogmatic about why she is having her own feast. There's a lot of speculation, but it simply says she's having her own feast while he's having his feast. So I kind of want to present a point that's going to drive the study And it's this, God's providence is expressed in the events that happen, everything we just talked about, but God's providence is also expressed in what he prevents from happening. So there are things that you don't even know what God has prevented in your life. You know that? Things that like you will never know until eternity that God has prevented. And a lot of us have the disposition or the audacity to go, what has God done for me lately? Where's God at? I'm going, you don't even know because there's things that he's prevented. I've told this story before, but it's embedded into my conscience about God's providence. So I'm going to tell it again. When I was in prison, I was on a unit with Jason Williams, a former NBA all-star. Him and I had influence amongst the prison at large, the tier at present. We were leading a Bible study. We were doing whatever we could to be salt and light in a very dark and decaying culture. There was a guard who hated our influence. She hated him, she despised me. In fact, she would time her rotation to come onto the housing unit every day when we were doing our Bible study, just so she could stir things up, curse at us, and kind of laugh and mock at this finding God all of a sudden, huh, guys? Well, one day she told the warden, long story short, that Jason and I had too much influence in the prison. True but she spun it as if it was a negative thing. So she convinced the warden to remove me from the unit that I had spent 18 months on and put me upstairs on the worst housing unit in the prison by far. All of the arguments and fights, all of the crimes and all of the violence took place on this unit. We all knew it. So mind you, I am about to pack up my stuff to go upstairs. Before I get upstairs, actually, I'm not even going to tell you what happened. I go upstairs. I feel like I'm descending spiritually, even though I'm climbing up steps. I remember thinking, God, where are you at in this? I was serving you. I was leading a Bible study. And now it was a gut check. I'm going upstairs. I move on to a new housing unit. And here's what happens. Within a day, a guard comes up. Mary, what happened yesterday? I got moved upstairs. He goes, no, no, no. Did you get into an argument with somebody? I'm like, no, nah, not that I recall. And then it dawned on me. In the midst of all this confusion, when she put the order out to move me, I went to the gate to get another guard's attention to have a conversation. And as I'm yelling for that guard, there's an inmate older behind me yelling down the housing unit, acting a fool. So I turn to him and firmly and respectfully say, his name was Pop, Pop, excuse me. I'm trying to get the guard's attention. I didn't think anything of it. He looked at me, I continued, officer, two east. I get moved upstairs by the warden's rule. This guard comes up the next day. What happened? Did you get into an argument with somebody? I'm like, no, why? He goes, pop? 
I'm like, oh yeah, what happened? He goes, we just locked him up because we found a shank in his locker, a knife. And when we asked him why he made it, he said he was gonna stick it in you for disrespecting him. Do you understand, like, the guard that wanted to move me was doing so because she had an ill will against Jason and I. She get, is able to convince the warden to move me. I get upstairs, unbeknownst that this inmate is plotting to stab me, unrelated to why I got moved. A few days later, the bunk bed next to me opens up. And who does God providentially move into that bunk? If you know me and my story, none other than John, little John Palladino, a former mob enforcer. And this guy did not want to come to this institution. He has been at other institutions that were for, you know, uh, uh, old heads or guys that have done real time. He didn't want to come to this short time facility. And yet God placed him in a bunk bed next to yours truly. And then God would use the way I was pursuing God at the time to attract little John's hard, broken, sinful heart. And God would save his soul, not because of me, in spite of me, because of providence. Now, I am not saying that providence is only when things work out, because it would have been providence if I got stabbed. Hello? And a believer would understand that God is going to recycle even that for his good and glory. How do I know that? Psalm 103, 19, the Lord has established his throne in heaven. His kingdom rules over all. Watch how this transitions. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Bistha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zether, and Kark. Anybody have a child on the way? There are some name ideas for you. <laughs> Seven eunuchs who served in the presence of the king to bring Queen Vashti, here we go, before the king, wearing her royal crown in order to show her beauty to the people and the officials, for she was beautiful to behold. Her name actually means beautiful. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command, brought by his eunuchs. Therefore, the king was furious, and his anger burned within him. Now, come on, put this together. Six-month summit, seven-day party, seventh day, wine has been flowing, drunk is on the rise, and the king wants to show off his queen. There's a lot of speculation. He invited her to come and show herself naked. Maybe, I don't know. Just come with her crown. Maybe, I don't know. Some say she didn't want to come because she was pregnant with Artaxerxes. Maybe, we do not know. The point is, she declined. That's all we need to know. Something's about to be prevented because there needs to be a vacancy in the kingdom because there needs to be a new queen that God would raise up. Are you seeing how all this is working? And he's furious. This is the type of man Xerxes was, irrational rage. He was a maniac. In fact, two years later, when he would invade Greece, they would build a bridge. The, build would be, the build, bridge would be destroyed by a storm. And to punish the storm, he threw chains into the ocean waters to put it into bondage and instructed his soldiers to pierce the waters with hot irons. This is the type of maniac that God is about to use and put Esther beside. Now, here's a point, not in the text, but I realize this man has at his disposal wealth, women, and wine, multiple wives, not just Vashti, and the whole world. And yet all of those things, get this please, pleasure and power cannot bring peace to a soul. No matter what you have, and here's the point, for 6,000 plus years, humanity has been absent or void of God, and God provided a way. It's in Christ alone. It's through Christ alone. That's the only power that God gives to bring satisfaction and contentment and to fill the hole in the soul. It's only Christ. It's not money. It's not a new job. It's not a new girlfriend. It's not a new wife. It's none of these things. It is only in Christ alone. Think about the technological advancements we've made as humans. We are so progressive, aren't we? We can split atoms, but we can't deal with the sin that was passed down by Adam. We can put a man on the moon, but we cannot keep a man from going to hell. We can cure a virus, but we can't cure sinfulness. And we can even transplant organs and hearts, but we can't transform hearts. Only Christ. Man is a wild beast, unharnessed by heaven. 
Proverbs 16, 14, as messengers of death is the king's wrath, but the wise man is able to appease it. When a king gets angry, the people are gonna suffer. That's what that means. When the king's wrath reaches a fullness, the people he rules over are going to experience an instability. How unstable is this one king where even his wife's decline of coming to his presence is about to affect the entire empire? So what does he do? He calls his wise men. The proverb says wise men appease wrath. The wise men in this situation, they're not going to appease wrath. They're going to release the wrath in a certain direction. Watch this. Then the king said to the wise men who understood the times, for this was the king's manner toward all who knew law and justice, those closest to him being, here's some more names for you, Karshana, Jather, Admatha, Tarshish, Mears, Marsena, and Memekin, the seven princes of Persia and Media who had access to the king's presence and who ranked highest in the kingdom. Here's the question. What shall we do to Queen Vashti according to law? Because she did not obey the command of King Ahasuerus brought to her by the eunuchs. He brings in his wise men who only know their land, their culture, and their laws. And their justice, you better believe, was perverted. So they're only able to provide the advisements and the counsels based on their skewed view of law and justice. But it don't make a difference because I can point to the present administration, which is godless, and all the handlers and counselors behind President Biden, and you better believe they're not giving him good counsel or biblical counsel. They're not understanding true biblical justice. But it makes no difference. In God's economy, he's able to use the incompetence of men man to set the stage for the omnipotence of who he is. This is what he does. I don't care how the decision comes. When you see it from God's sovereignty, you understand. I don't have to agree with what hap- with what's happening, but I go, God's still going to turn that into something for his glory. Here's what the advice is. And Memekin answered before the king and the princes, Queen Vashti has not only wronged the king, but also the princes. Look how he personalized this. He must have had a problem in his home with his wife, don't you think? <laughs> I got a solution, king. What she did has affected us and all the people in all the provinces. For the queen's behavior will become known to all women so that they will despise their husbands in their eyes. When they report, King Uasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought in before him, but she did not come. This very day, the noble ladies of Persia and Media will say to all the king's officials that they have heard of the behavior of the queen. Thus, there will be an excessive contempt. You see, they're gonna use this to get the king to decree a law where their wives must submit to their rule. Now, there have been people who've made lessons. This is biblical, and I'm going, they were not trying to be biblical in their logic. So I'm not even going to go there. They're simply using an experience between the king and the queen to try to get women to submit. In other words, they fear that this will incite a women's liberation movement. So what happens? Verse 19. If it pleases the king, let a royal decree go out from him and let it be recorded in the laws of the Persians and the Medes. The laws of the Persians and the Medes is a law once made, cannot be reversed. You have to understand that. Cannot be reversed. Yet no matter what that law is, God is still able to weave his providence through it. Remember, he uses the natural supernaturally so that it will not be altered, that Vashti shall come no more before King Ahasuerus and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. When the king's decree, which he will make, is proclaimed through all his empire, for it is great, all wives will honor their husbands, both great and small. Yeah, that ain't gonna happen. What I wanted you to see is, and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. Let the king give away her position. This is a prophecy, and the person that's speaking it doesn't even know it. Do you understand what I'm saying? God will use somebody, doesn't even believe in him, to say something that is prophetic. Watch this. In John 11, the same thing happens. The leaders come to the high priest. We got to deal with Jesus. He's doing miracles. People are going to believe him, and if we don't stop him, the Romans are going to take our place and our nation Verse 49, John 11. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation should not perish. Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not just for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one 
the children of God who were scattered abroad, the high priest who was the main architect behind hanging Jesus on a cross and stirring the people up, said, you're wrong. It's better for him to die and not the nation to die. Meanwhile, fulfilling God's plan all along. It's a prophecy unaware. And I'm seeing God's providence that even in the things that we don't see him doing, he is constantly working. Proverbs 19, 21. Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Church, God is able to carry out his will without violating your will. God is able to carry out his will without violating human will. This is what the cross exclaims. Man's hands took the son of God and pinned him to a beam. And yet that was the same place that the father's will needed the son to be. I hope that encourages somebody because no matter what you're going through, no matter what has happened, if God was able to take the greatest evil, the killing of his own son, and actually ordained it, I can read you scriptures out of Acts 2 and Acts 4 that prove this was predetermined. This was the foresight of God. This was the foreknowledge of God. This was the providence of God. Hell, look, he took something that naturally happened and supernaturally he used it. That's what the cross exclaims. Let's land this plane. Verse 21 and 22. And the reply pleased the king and the princes and the king did according to the word of Memekin. Then he sent letters to all the king's provinces, to each province in his own script, to every people in their own language, that each man should be a master in his own house and speak in the language of his own people. In other words, the man of the house, it's his language that should be the language of the home, not the, not the woman's, not the wives. I hope chapter one and there's a lot more. I'm, I'm skipping over a lot of my notes. I hope knowing Esther's history should cause you to ponder human history, but it also should cause you to ponder your story, your history. People have asked all the time, how did you and your wife meet? What people don't know is that when I got in trouble in March of 2009, it was soon after that where my mother, through a mutual friend, met my now mother-in-law, Sarah's mom. They knew each other through other mutual friends, but they began to co-teach a Bible study. It was during that Bible study where my now mother-in-law, Charlize, discovered that I was the individual who got in trouble. So there was this bond created. For whatever reason, Charlize, not knowing me, not knowing my family, other than meeting my mom, had this desire to pray for me. And then she brought that prayer request to her family, her husband and her four daughters. Mind you, my mom is a mother of four boys. And they would often joke about matching up four daughters with four boys. And now that I'm thinking about it and my story, I think that's exactly what happened. (laughs) Several years later is when Sarah and I would strike up this pen pal ship. I'm an inmate of the state and here this beautiful, young girl is writing into me and we're striking up this bond. Only God could kind of, actually, if I didn't go to prison, there would have been no correspondence. And the fact that she's telling her mom and her dad that she's writing me in prison, perhaps spurred on by Charlize, I don't know if it was agreed by Jamie, my father-in-law, but maybe because Charlize knew Anne, my mom, it was a little bit easier to swallow because I think I know the family But I gotta be honest with you, because I could talk about the providence of God as Sarah and I came to be married eventually. I can teach it, I can sermonize it. You can ask me questions about it. But I'm a father now, and I totally understand that when one day my little daughter Willow comes up to me and says, Dad, I'm writing a guy in prison. (laughs) I'm gonna say, sweetie, I know that your mother and mine's story involves like that similar dynamic? I know daddy preached about it in the book of Esther. But look at me. Go to your room, you are grounded. (laughs) Hey, hey, little John. uh, Hey guys, here's my main point as I close. God's providential work may appear hidden, but we should never assume he is doing nothing. Who would have thought in, in my life, my story, in, in your life, your story, God is like, he's allowing things to happen 
events to unfold. He's preventing things from happening, whether you realize it or not. His work may be hidden. His presence may be silent, but he's never absent. His providence is weaving and working through a story of redemption. The cross is the perfect example. The book of Esther should comfort us. It should enhance our worship of a God of sovereignty. It should strengthen our trust in God's heart, even when we cannot trace his hand. Church, if you believe this, would you go be this? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you yet again for your good word. I pray it has been administered well to your people, that they're encouraged, that they're challenged, that they're charged to understand your providence, your sovereignty, that you are always in control. Thank you for using us for such a time as this. Thank you that human history shows forth your glory. So take us deeper in our discipleship. Bless your people on this beautiful weekend where we celebrate an independence and we would protect it because it has been inspired by you. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen.